Hey, welcome to another episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl, Stephanie Hardy. If this is your first time listening to my show, welcome and thank you for joining the ride. And if this isn't your first time listening, thank you for continuing to go on this journey with me. So in this episode, we're going to talk about news and gossipish, and there's a Of course, always a lot going on in the world of professional wrestling. And then we're going to go to my interview with the totally awesome independent wrestler from South Korea, Duncan Solaire. And then after that, I'll have a little bit of um, a recap to talk about what's coming up this weekend with the pay-per-view TLC. So sit back, relax, and catch the vibes. This is the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. Okay, so now I got your news and gossipish, and there's some stuff to cover. So we're going to start with the GOAT of wrestling, Ric Flair, talking about the possibility of WWE opening a Hall of Fame in Orlando. So this week he had um, an interview on ESPN's The Jump with Rachel Nichols, who's an amazing um, newscaster on ESPN. So I do suggest you check it out if you're a sports person, check out ESPN's The Jump. He had an interview with her, and so while he was discussing his new Adidas um, sneaker collab with Damian Lillard, who plays for the Blazers, um, he talked more about how the shoe is based off of his golden ring robe. He also said that WWE had purchased that robe from him for inclusion in this very Hall of Fame, Flair told her, her, and that they were in the process of building a Hall of Fame, um, a physical structure in Orlando, though this undertaking was delayed by um, COVID-19. Um, now, the Wrestling Observer did say that um, when they requested a comment from WWE about this, they didn't respond to it immediately. Now, they don't have a Hall of Fame building, even though they have a couple of different um references and different you know knickknacks to sort of pay tribute to people at the headquarters in Stanford Connecticut they don't really have a museum per se but I feel like they would you know benefit from a museum because it will always because I feel like well for me I love museums and I would love to have a chance to actually go to a museum to see you know what other historical knickknacks they have like with their titles and different cages that they used to use back in the day and stuff like that so if they were to put all that in a hall of fame museum also you know paying tribute to the people who's in their illustrious hall of fame that's been taking place for for decades now I would love you know to see some of that some of that stuff so if they did have one I think that would be really cool but of course you know with everything going on with COVID-19 I'm pretty sure if they did have plans for it it's been sort of turned upside down now but here's hoping that they, that maybe they'll continue to do that in the future and still plan for that because hey I want to go to a new museum so <laughs> and I feel like it would be really good for fans to have a place to go to um to take pictures at and to you know buy merch from and all that other stuff and not to mention outside people who are really curious about the history of wrestling can go in and sort of look and look in that museum and then you know sort of beef up tourism more in Orlando but then again they really don't need that because they're Orlando and they got Disney World and Universal Studios and all that other stuff so I think that'll be cool also um in that article he was talking about those shoes so please get those Damian Lillard shoes if you have a mind to they're out now and they're really cute so please get those um also in the news our truth is um has an, has been announced as the host of the slammy awards this wednesday so he appeared on wwe's the bump um this past wednesday morning where the announcement was made and it was also announced that the slammy awards pre-show will air um on next wednesday at 10 a.m eastern 9 central standard time for birmingham people followed by the full award ceremony and at the slammies will air on the wwe network um the wwe website youtube facebook and twitter and that the pre-show will air in the place of the bump so if you may or may not know um the slammy awards is sort of like their year-end awards that they used to have the last time they had it, i believe it was in 2015 and they hadn't really had it since now nxt you know would have normally had their um year-end awards um at this point but i don't i'm not sure if they're going to have it or not going to have it or whatever but the slammies are sort of like sort of like you know who was the superstar of the year male or female the um match of the year and different awards in rivalry of the year and different awards like that so 
it's going to be really interesting to see who's going to come out the winner and come out on top of that. Because frankly, I'm thinking that match of the year should totally go to Sasha Banks and Bailey for their Hell in a Cell match. And male superstar of the year should totally be Roman Reigns because his performance as the evil dastardly heel tribal chief that he's been has just been nothing short of amazing. And female superstar of the year should be Sasha Banks, but we'll see. And then they also have gear of the year. And I feel like um, wrestling gear of the year should totally go to Bianca Belair because she makes her own gear and it's always the cutest. So... Um, you can also vote on WWE.com for who you think should win in those categories as well. So please check that out. Also in the news, we have Paul Heyman discussing working with CM Punk. So if you may or may not know, CM Punk was a wrestler for WWE from, say, like the early 2010s, you know, all like from yeah until like. 2014 where he fell out with the company and just decided to leave and then he they fired him unceremoniously on his wedding day to AJ Lee who was also a um, professional wrestler they're both retired now so but during the time in which he was in WWE he was working with Paul Heyman who's an amazing manager creative mind in wrestling and also the creator of ECW so historically he's done a lot in the wrestling business so he's so Paul Heyman spoke of working with CM Punk during um an Inside the Ropes live show recently um and he said this about the time that WWE put them together he said I look over at him and he says, can you believe they're effing putting us together, said Heyman. And I'm like, we're going to both be effing fired in the next four weeks. Don't you get it? And he goes, but the ish we're going to we're going to stir in four weeks. They don't effing have a clue. And then Paul Heyman said, I loved working with him. I loved it. I had the time of my life. And he said the WWE had given both him and Punk creative freedom to to deliver unscripted promos. And of that, he said, we had a blast working with each other because just like me, he had no idea what he was going to say when he went out to the ring. He was just doing it, you know, allegedly shoot promos that then get wrapped around into the storyline that we're telling that he fervently believed in his heart that he was telling the truth. And um, he also said um, that CM Punk, that one way to get in CM Punk's corner was the way to get fans to gasp since they were going to boo the intended John Cena either way. So um, they became an alliance in 2012 when CM Punk helped Alberto Del Rio beat John Cena in a Falls Count Anywhere match on Raw. And then Punk got into a car with Paul Heyman and then pulled away slowly. And then their alliance ended a year later when Paul Heyman and Curtis Axel got together and turned on CM Punk before Night of Champions. So I remember while they were together, they did a lot of cool stuff um, together. So it's amazing now when you think of how it's like when Paul Heyman hooks up with different wrestlers and it's almost like a match made in heaven. Because I always imagine him with Brock Lesnar and how that was always, you know, one of the best um, tandems going in in terms of a manager and a wrestler. But then you also think of him now, you know, when you think of um, placing, when you place a wrestler with Paul Heyman, it's almost like they're using Paul Heyman to sort of make them into a star. And when he was with, and when he was with Curtis Axel, there was a little bit of an effect there, but they didn't really put a whole lot of gas behind it. And then, of course, now you have Paul Heyman with Roman Reigns, and it seems like that's definitely a match made in heaven. Now that Roman Reigns is showing more of his evil dastardly side and it feel and it's almost like Paul Heyman is more of treating him like you know you're my liege and I'm literally you know just your advocate but not just an advocate but just like an evil genius behind the scenes helping you get this evil stuff done and Paul Heyman is really one of the best you know managers and he's also one of the best talkers in the entire business as well because he can sell a story you know I feel like he could sell sell a story to a can. So um, Paul Heyman has a lot left, you know, to give to the wrestling business. And I'm so glad that he's there. Um, honestly, I would love for him to like beef me up during the day because I would actually feel like I can handle things a whole lot better than sometimes I do. So, yeah. Um, also in the news, we have Japanese police. Um who are legally opening up a case against the bully of Hana Kimura. So earlier this year, there was this um, Japanese female wrestler named Hana Kimura who was featured on this show called Terrace House. 
on Netflix. And she was also a professional wrestler who had also wrestled with the likes of Kyrie Sane and Io Shirai and Asuka. And she was cyberbullied relentlessly for how she was on the for how she was perceived on the show, which led to her possibly which led to her possibly killing herself um, and feeling like, you know, she couldn't go on anymore because it was very it was just very tough for her and seeing all these people say these negative things about her. So now the police in Osaka, Japan, have begun a legal case against a man who is alleged to have cyberbullied her and they referred the case to prosecutors and they alleged that the man who has not been named posted anonymous and particularly malicious threats to the star. She was just 22 years old and she was um, triggered by an altercation with a male cast member on the show Tara's house and she was vilified for her appearance and her comportment. And before she um, passed away, she said online, I receive nearly 100 honest opinions every day, and I could not deny that it hurts my feelings. She also posted a photo of herself on Instagram together with an apology. And local media in Japan reported that the man has previously admitted to a charge of public insult and in June apologized to Kimura's family. Now, something that I am a proponent of on this show is being a decent human being. And something that irritates me and something that I did see earlier um, this week with Lacey Evans having, you know, fan mail sent to, you know, her house. Um, she was she had to tell people on Twitter that, you know, don't send, you know, that type of mail to my house. Send it to the performance center because you always have fans who have a tendency to take stuff a little bit too far and take stuff too seriously. And invade their privacy and something that irritates me is the fact that just because you see these celebrities or these people on television living public lives does not and doing superhuman things on television doesn't mean that they don't have human feelings you can't just expect these people to just bend and move when you feel like they should bend and move because they're not objects and yeah they are there for your entertainment but they're not objects and they're not toys that you play with these are human beings and you should treat them with the utmost respect so if they tell you to back up a little bit of course when everything was normal at a meet and greet or if they tell you to respect their privacy or respect their space you need to do that you can't just break into their house like someone did with Sonya Deville you know and just assume that they're just supposed to do everything you want them to do and then you know do something crazy like try to kidnap them or whatever like they deserve to have as much peace as any ordinary person does so I've so on the Hardy Wrestling podcast, if you're not a decent person, you know, that treats people like human beings and I have nothing to say to you and this is not the space for you. But um, if you treat people like, you know, they're human beings, then I will respect you and give you all the love that you deserve. Um, but just, let's just respect each other and be good human beings to one another because there's enough darkness in the world. Be the light. Hello. Um, <laughs> so... Now that I'm finished with that part, um, also in the news, Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers are teaming up again to fight an Impact Wrestling's Hard to Kill pay-per-view. So, this past um, Tuesday, Kenny Omega um, announced that he was going to reunite with his former Bullet Club stablemates, um, the Good Brothers and Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows, um, to participate in a six-man tag team match at the Hard to Kill pay-per-view next month. And he's going to be facing um, Impact World Champion Rich Swan and the Motor City Machine Guns, Alex Shelley and Chris Saban. So um, this is going to be interesting because it sort of leads into me. It sort of leads into the idea that I had about um, Rich Swan and Kenny Omega beefing with one another since this crossover thing has happened. Because you have Kenny Omega thinking that since he's the AEW World Champion, that that one's more important than the Impact World Champion. And a lot of people on social media didn't like that because they felt like as since Rich Swan is a black um, world champion, they felt like he was going to be undermined, you know, with that. And they felt like, and a lot of people felt like, you know, that wasn't a good thing, but at the same time, they're going to be beefing with one another. And I feel like that's always going to be a good rivalry. But at the same time, I could understand how people could feel like, oh, well, they're just going to undermine this black wrestler because they feel like black wrestlers are in a place now where they shouldn't be undermined and that they should be respected as much as any white champion. So, um, 
I feel like this is going to be a good match heading into Hard to Kill. But then again, there isn't so much that I can say about Impact as much as I would like to because I don't watch it as much. And I'm just starting to get into it now that this crossover with AEW is happening. But I am excited about it. And also... I'm excited about Kiara Hogan and Tasha Steeles making it into the finals of the knockout tag team title tournament. And they um, defeated Rosemary and Taya Valkyrie. And now they're going to go on to face either Jordan Grace and Jazz or Havoc and Nevaeh. So congratulations to them. And hopefully they'll go on to win the knockout tag, um, tag team titles. So that's really all that's going on um, in the world of professional wrestling with news and gossipish. And now we're going to go to my interview with the absolutely stunning and stellar Duncan Solaire. Hello. Hey. Hey. Nice to finally meet you. Yes, oh. nice to meet you too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm well rested. I have to block some people, but otherwise, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, and I'm so happy to have you, Duncan. Not a problem. Should I introduce myself, or will you be? Uh... Um, I'll do it um, myself, so you won't have to worry about it. No issue, no issue. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start my interviews the way that I always start and ask, um, when did you fall in love with wrestling? Alright, so this is a funny story. Back when I was really little, I used to play WrestleMania 2000 on my N64, right? Mm-hmm. And I liked it because who didn't like being stone cold and just like beating people up with stone cold. Um, but I wouldn't say I was in love with it. It was just something that I kind of did, like Mario or Sonic. But it was fourth grade when some um, kids and they were actually kind of jerks to me, <laughs> but they were talking about wrestling and they were talking about how these guys were just. I'm like, you know, it's fake, right? So, mm. then I so I did not tune in. I'm like, and it was the episode, I remember it clearly. It was the episode where Kane electrocuted uh, Shane McMahon. Or, uh, detail, but uh, you can watch it on YouTube, everybody. <laughs> so uh, it was the episode where he electrocuted Shane McMahon, and I bought it like hook, line, and sinker. And I would say, that was the moment I was first caught. But then when I saw... Who was it? When I saw the Christian RVD match, I think that's where I was like fully bought in at that point. Okay. That's pretty interesting how um, you started the story um talking about these these people who were basically like bullying you and then they were talking about how you know it's fake right and that resonates with me because i can't tell you how many times i've had so many people tell me you know it's fake right and i'm just like no it actually kind of isn't <laughs> um so it's clear uh, i was the one who came into it thinking it was fake like the people from my elementary school they were like jerks but like they were really into wrestling and that was like my one up on them I'm like Haha, you know it's fake mm-hmm. right and then I it, and then like we didn't even become friends afterwards it was just like they were the only people I hung out with we were not friends by like any metric of any definition of friendship but uh, yeah no they were the inciting incident as it were to get me into wrestling um as far as falling in love with being a wrestler, that would I would have to be was when I was 18. And I had stopped watching wrestling for a while because it was during that mid 2000s period where, well, yeah, mid to late 2000s period where things were like really, really bad and really, like, really, really bad, the celebrity hosts and stuff. So, um, 
I got back into wrestling around that time and one of my friends was training to be a wrestler so we started training and yeah that's where I really fell in love with it and I just did it until until I stopped and then I came to Korea and then started again (laughs) okay you mentioned that you stopped like what exactly was it that made you stop doing it um so without slandering anybody who's currently on WWE TV right now um there was an incident where I was in a match with somebody and they dropped me on my head and it messed me up pretty bad and it was like intentional on their part um everybody says that they're a super nice guy now but back then uh they dropped me on my head and then everybody was like on their side until I explained what happened they were like, oh, well, if we would have known, I'm like, you're supposed to be my trainer. How did you not know? But, uh, yeah. After that, I was just kind of burnt out with dealing with people in the locker room. So I kept wrestling, but I wasn't really enjoying it. And I think my last match in America was like, like a tag team match for um, SSW, um, which is this really good promotion in the Midwest Uh, a bunch of big name indie guys have gone through SSW Um, but yeah I think that was my last time doing an American wrestling match and then I was just like I'm burnt out I can't do it anymore Um, because it's like SSW there was nothing wrong with them they were actually really really good I didn't like wrestling anymore at that point and it first started when I got dropped on my head by that guy who was going to remain nameless wow (laughs) So, basically, you had an injury that sort of um, kept you from it, and then you just sort of became a little bit discontented with it um, until until you finally just got back into the groove of it? Yep. That's how I would best say it. Like, you don't, like, once it bites you, you don't really stop. I mean, I can't stop. Like, there's a lot of drama that I've seen in wrestling but it's still like really addictive for me like I'll show up anytime that there's a show I'll always be there um even though I know all of like the sausage process of wrestling I still genuinely enjoy watching it genuinely enjoy engaging in it learning about it it's just a really engrossing topic okay so when would you say you knew you wanted to really pursue this as a career or something that you would do for the rest of your life? Now, that's a funny bit because I don't know if there was a distinct moment. I remember being back in training when I was 18 and then when I was 20. I remember coming over here and I don't think there was ever a moment where I decided it would be my career I think there was just always a moment where I would feel empty if I wasn't doing it like when I stopped doing it I would still miss doing it and there's always of course like that um kid inside of me where I want to like trick about making it to like the big news of like NJPW or AJPW um or like AEW or something like that like there are those moments where I catch myself dreaming like that I don't know if I would ever say that I had a moment where I realized I wanted to be my career I just know that once I started I knew that I wanted to keep doing it and every time that I've been like I don't want to do it no more or something like that like five minutes later I'm like dreaming up spots Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm thinking like different ways to like finesse and moves that nature thinking about like oh what would I do in this situation or cool matches that I saw that I want to emulate in some way like it's really hard for me to like turn that part off okay I totally get that now 
one question that I do want to ask is, um, as I was going through and watching some of your matches on YouTube and stuff, um, I noticed that you were calling yourself the vibe dealer. So a part of me wants to know, like, where did you get that? Where was the inspiration for that character and where did it come from exactly? All right, so this is actually a funny story because I was originally supposed to be uh, the dreaded Duncan Solaire, you know, like, because win or lose, you're going to hate seeing me come out. I was supposed to be, like, this really obnoxious Ms. Jericho kind of heel. Mm-hmm. But um, I never really got that ability. <laughs> and then one of the one of the commentators just, like, read my shirt, the vibe dealer, and I was like, ah, oh, boy. And then, you know, people just kept going with the vibe dealer shtick. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll go with it, too. Um, I got a shirt from this really great musician known as Drea, the vibe dealer. If you ever want to check her out, she's on Spotify. Um, She was doing a tour this year. I don't know if she's still on tour. She's also on Instagram. Uh, Drea, the vibe dealer. She's the OG vibe dealer. She's um, She's the queen of the vibe dealing things. Um, and I got her co-sign to be like a vibe dealer as long as I wasn't calling myself like the, um, I believe it's like, as long as I didn't bite the whole support your local Mm -hmm. vibe dealer thing like that, it's completely, uh, co-signed by her and things of that nature, which means a lot, but, um, yeah, it was the original intent. It was just the commentator making an offhand comment one day and it just (laughs) kind of bloomed into that. Okay, that's a pretty cool way to come up with a name. It sounds like it kind of just happened out of nowhere, (laughs) but not really out of nowhere, but just it was just something that he saw and he just sort of went with it. So I think that's pretty cool. I agree. I agree. And something else I also noticed in watching your videos is that people, um, some of the people in your audiences call you Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, God. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they call me that every time. Well, that, they've stopped calling me that. They've stopped calling me that as much as of late. I think it's because I'm nicer to them now. Also, I changed my music. But yeah, they don't call me that anymore. Or at least they haven't in the last few shows. Yeah, the first time I heard that, I thought that was so cute. I mean, I could tell it irritated you. But at the same time, I was just like, I feel like this is really adorable. Like, I wonder how many people are named Duncan and then they get called Duncan Donuts. Like, I never thought about that before in my life. But then once they once they chanted it, I was just like, wow. <laughs> like, it's like the time they said it, I had to try so hard not to break here because I was about to crack up. Oh. <laughs> Like, every time they do it, like, I have to get the character more and more upset. And, like, for me personally, like, I just took it as an opportunity to, like, make a few stickers and stuff. I was going to do a t-shirt, but I was like, nah, it's not worth it. And now the gimmick is kind of over with that. But I remember my character would get so aggro about it. Just, like, every step of the way, I have to get more and more angry. To the point where I had to just like somehow transition away from being the angry character. <laughs> Cause like it was getting to the point where there would be no there's no way I could top it aside from like going full Christian temper tantrum and just like messing up stuff. Wow. Like and yeah, like there had to be a ceiling somewhere. Yeah, I get it. Um, so I wanna ask you, of course, um, the world has sort of been dealing with um, making so many changes due to the um, pandemic that's happening worldwide. So I want to ask you how exactly has your career been affected by it and how exactly have you been able to um, adapt to it? So um, as far as career being affected by it, a goal for 2020, um, especially because it was an important year for me, um, at least personally. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I wanted to work at least two different countries. And so my plan was going to be I was going to work in Korea and in Japan. And I was going to like hit the gym super hard. I was going to train super hard. And I was going to go 
and wrestle in Japan for a little bit. Then when COVID hit, it like crushed everything because we were supposed to be getting um, some people from India to come in. It was going to be like a clash of worlds kind of gimmick. Um, But yeah, that didn't happen. And then so we needed to start to adjust our booking around the fact that, you know, people aren't allowed in certain places, not to mention we weren't like there was just so much that got canceled and things of that nature. And so, as far as my career goes, um, I started the year off like a hundred followers, and then like I've gone up to like three hundred on Instagram. Uh, people really like my promos, which again is always appreciated um, every step of the way. Uh, I was planning on doing like more modeling or acting things to like blow up, but as I'm starting to build a little bit, like a little bit, not not too much, just a little bit of a fan, you know, a mm-hmm. little bit of a fan base. <laughs> uh, I think I'm gonna just start uh, working Instagram road, I suppose. Um, the goal is to hit like that micro influencer level, look around like a thousand, and then see how far I can go there. But as of late, there haven't really been that many opportunities because um, it's just hard to get in contact with people. It's hard to arrange things um, because Korea takes it a lot more seriously than America does. And so if things are shut down, things are just shut down. And so with that in mind, we are like trying to navigate those areas. Now, we have done some collaborations with some big YouTubers. Um, We have done some what's the word I would say we have had some creative projects that we have come up with Um, we did a battle royale gimmick which was based solely around comedy which uh, people seem to like but um, as far as my career goes it's kind of like curtailed it a bit because a lot of the opportunities that I would be able to kind of finesse into have been limited but, you know, we persevere, we overcome. I'm currently in a tag team now, and uh, we're going to try to make it the best tag team in South Korea. I mean, we're, so far, there are only, like, four. <laughs> okay, and if you don't mind, like, who exactly are you also in a tag team with? All right, so this guy's name is In Beyond on um, Instagram. He's also goes by Gimme, or rather... His name is Gim Gimin. So he's Kim Gimin, but that's, I get that like, so his last name and his first name are the same, and I can't deal with this boy. But yeah, follow him at Unbeyond. He's goofy. He loves old school, like, city pop. Um, his gimmick is like, he's like a flamenco dancer or something. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, he's like soup. Like, boy has a natural promo skill. Uh, he's still a little bit green, but I mean, who isn't? And so, like, he's really, really, really good at selling his character, which is kind of funny because we're kind of being transitioned more into like a, um, into like a, what's the word I would say? Into like a too cool Scotty Too Hotty Grandmaster Sexy rap, a uh, Bandango and Brizango, uh, Brizango mm-hmm. rap, rather. And yeah, that's kind of the route that the fans have been pushing us towards because of the reactions that they've been giving to me and him. And so that's the way that we have to transition it. But he's got like a natural, just arrogant, annoying, obnoxious personality when he cuts his promos, which is hilarious. Okay, that sounds cool. I'll be sure to check you guys out and I'll be sure to... um find him and look him up and look at his stuff um but to go back to you um I want to ask you how do you feel about the wrestling landscape in terms of um the independent circuit um in South Korea the independent circuit in South Korea is unfortunately one of the more closed off areas that I have been in um I remember when I first started and this is a funny story to me I first started at this small company in Southern Illinois and they were like the most professional company that we had seen because they had like a whole ring with like their own building and they had 
banners and it looked really like me um that was the only like professional thing that they had <laughs> because uh, we got into the locker room and it was oof it was a lot but anyway we finish our first show with them and they tell us all right if you wrestle with us you can't wrestle with this other company anymore i'm like okay because i'm like 18 but looking back on it that's like the weirdest thing like we're on the indies what do you mean i can't wrestle for another company but fast forward to where i am now and here it's not that you aren't allowed to wrestle with other companies it's that other companies here do not like wrestling with other companies so there are two to three major companies in south korea not including ws which is um, WWA, um, PWA, and no, wait, PWA is out of business. Uh, WWA, PWF, and then I think like KPW or something like that. It's like very, very, they don't run frequently. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of arrogance associated with a lot of companies, we will say. Um, so much so that they feel as though they are like better than PWS, the company that I currently work for. Even though most of the people in PWS have either worked around or know the wrestlers in these other companies. And it's just a real catty kind of thing because from my perspective, nobody's like turning their nose up at working with these other companies. Um, it's just the other companies tend to have like a more negative view of ours and from what I've heard from like Korean wrestlers and from the English speaking wrestlers and it just seems as though it's like a lot of high school stuff it doesn't seem like it's a real healthy kind of area for Korean wrestling um, to be in because it's like nobody gets better by themselves like there needs to be like a community there needs to be a scene right now if there's one company you can really wrestle for in South Korea and that's it and everybody else is like very very closed off that just is not going to be good um, so yeah that's where I would probably say the scene is that um, our company tends to be a little bit more inclusive and more welcoming uh, but by that same token it's like we are still like the new company on the block we're getting big pretty fast but yeah like it would be a lot better if other companies were willing to work together to build up the entire scene okay <laughs> you're, you're just like okay oh no Moving like on. I'm just <laughs> listening to everything you're saying and this is your truth and I definitely appreciate you you know telling your truth I'm just you know just taking it all in um honestly <laughs> um so it's not like a okay like an awkward okay it's more of a i'm listening okay with full intent so yeah um so i would i think what i want to ask you now is um do you have would you say that you have more of a larger a large fan base As far as our company goes, like, I have a lot of Instagram followers. And, of course, I have, like, people who react to me when I come out in the ring. Um, but, like, I would not necessarily say I have a large fan base because, um, again, I was trained by a lot of old school guys. Like, until people are, like, paying to see me specifically, I don't really feel like I have any sort of a fan base. I also have not sh sold any merch yet, so I would not be able to tell if I have um, any fans <laughs> um, I'm like waiting until I have like a solid set of alright I know this person will pay for stuff from me not just because we're friends but because like they like my wrestling or they like my promos or something like that so once I have merch to sell people I'll then be able to get like a better barometer of like how big my fan base is as far as I can tell you though um, I always get a reaction when I come out there's never anybody who's sitting on their hands when they see me in the ring. 
And of course, um, I average around like 100 views on any videos that I post. So I have like a pretty okay fan base, especially for our company. Okay, that's good. I mean, it's always good to start somewhere because, I mean, at least because I know even with me as a podcaster, you know, I'm glad that I have the little bit that I do have. It's definitely a miracle considering I just started. So it's always good, you know, to start somewhere. And then you hope that the that the greater you, the more you learn and the better you get, the more the followers will come. So, yeah. I have faith in you, though, because you're awesome. So, <laughs> um, hmm? uh- Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So we're going to switch gears. I'm going to ask you, um, who are some of your favorite wrestlers from any area? And they could be um, male, female, or um, non-binary. So some of my favorite wrestlers, like, on the scene right now? Mm Mm-hmm. Or just period, ever. Okay, so first... (laughs) Okay. Oh, that's... Okay, so I'm going to segment that. I'm going to break that up. First, for on the scene right now, um, there's Prince KK, a.k.a. Caden Pierre. He is amazing, and I love him, and he's just the most adorable person ever. Um, so check him out on Instagram at uh, Prince Caden. And then, or Caden Pierre, I, I, I forget his at. Don't yell at me, Caden. Um, of course, I got to shout out the two people who I spent the most time in wrestling with, two of my best friends in life, uh, Marcelo Spade and Shane Fury, a.k.a. Natural Fury. They are the best tag team in the Midwest, and I don't care anybody who says differently is wrong. Uh, Marcelo Spade is one of the funniest people to ever exist. He is ridiculous. From the moment I first met him, that dude had me cracking up. Um, don't don't tell him you don't like the Green Lantern. He will he will give you an extended like thesis paper about oh. like why you're wrong. Um, I believe Shane also goes under. You can either find him under Shane Foster, like Furious Shane Foster, or Shane Fury. I forget which name he goes under. Shane, you can't be mad at me. You've changed your name like nine <laughs> times. It's not. It's not fair. So those are two of my favorites. Uh, Shane moves around excellent, especially for a larger guy, and he's always working on like getting better. And of course, Marcelo. Uh, I mean. Tommaso put him over, so yeah, I'm a I'm a big up my friends. He got put over by Tommaso Ciampa before he was in NXT. So yeah, whatever you want to say. Hey. Uh, <laughs> aside, hey, indeed. Um, so those are some of my favorite indie people. Uh, as far as um, oh, over here, there's this kid JD Lee. This kid is probably the best wrestler pound for pound I have ever seen. He's one of those people you'll show him a move one time and he'll be able to hit it perfect he is like a great mind he has a great mind for wrestling um as far as like he's willing to learn he can do any of the flippy that you you want flippy you want flippy he'll give you flippy he'll give you all of the flippy you (laughs) could ever want (laughs) um i don't know if this guy is still wrestling but another really really good one that i've known is um just amazing he's a really good guy um him and his wife uh ko kendra uh, just two good salt of the earth kind of wrestlers just really really good just could do anything that you ask them to he's like a miniature ricochet in the sense that he's shorter but like don't get mad at me just amazing uh i gotta keep telling people not to get mad at me because you know i'm not a bad character anymore so i don't want nobody thinking that i'm dissing um is there anybody else on the indies that I would really, really put over? Oh, well, no, he doesn't wrestle anymore. Like when you get to my when you get to my old age, when you're becoming an old lady, <laughs> you just you just find not too many of your friends is is wrestling no more. <laughs> uh, but no, um, moving more into like a professional scene, I would say on the majors, I would probably say uh, I like. As far as promos, Bray Wyatt is an amazing promo. Terrible person, but an amazing promo. Um, who else would I say I really, really enjoy? AEW, I like how they've done John Moxley. I've always been a big fan of um, Moxley. 
Mm-hmm. Also, I would say I like Biggie, Kofi, of course. Like, basically, if you were to pull up, like, black wrestlers, there are very few black wrestlers that I do not genuinely enjoy. I really love what Impact has been doing with Chris Bay. Um, moving over into, like, Japan, Tama Tonga is one of my favorite. Like, he's just so ancient. <laughs> he's just such a mean guy. Love him. Um, yeah, that would be. Oh, and of course, myself. I'm uh, my favorite wrestler, and uh, that's just that. So, uh, best, just best wrestler of the current era is me. But um, as far as favorite wrestlers all time, I would probably go Eddie or just it's Eddie. Like, who's going to disagree with Eddie? Um, Sean. Booker, even though I don't agree with a lot of the things Booker says as of late, as far as wrestling goes, Booker is probably one of my faves. I grew up absolutely loving Crime Time. I know they were really problematic, but I loved them. Edge, Jericho, um, really big influences on me as far as moveset and, of course, like just intensity. I love Edge's intensity when he's in the ring. Um, and um, this one's a little bit more embarrassing. So um, I'm going to need you to edit this one out. Steph- Stephanie, I need you. Yes, I'm Stephanie, here. Stephanie, <laughs> are you there? I, I need, need you to edit this okay. next one out, okay? As I, I people question my wrestling shoes. Okay. Head, okay. John <laughs> 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 No, like, uh, Cena's really, really good. He's a <laughs> promo. For somebody who started off, like, with um, questionable wrestling skills, and trust me, I know my skills are super questionable at times. Uh, he's definitely improved. He's one of the better, like, matches consistently. Um, as far as on the um, women's side of things, um, uh, I had a lot of favorite female wrestlers. Um, of course, Queen Trish. Loved her loved every match that she was in Victoria amazing um, I never got the Lita hype I, I just I, when I was growing up they were just treating Lita very terribly so I never really <laughs> cognizated but uh, I never really had the cognition of oh yeah she was amazing uh, which again that probably is just on the fact that um, I watched at the wrong times um, outside of that, ODB, I loved her in TNA. ODB was so good. I loved Awesome Kong. Even when they brought her over to WWE as Karma, I, I was like, I'm here for it. Asuka, of course. I'm trying to think of anybody else. Um, oh, old 90s favorite wrestler. Uh, <clears throat> edit this out. X-Pac. <clears throat> um... Yeah, I would say I was a big fan of those uh, wrestlers. Like, I I will typically stand most wrestlers that I see if they do something that I find appealing. Like most people. Like most people. If you do something cool, I'll typically say it's cool. But if I were to pick, like, an all-time faves, it would be um, Eddie, Shelton, Then it gets really fuzzy, but I'm going to probably put Trish, Asuka, and then, don't judge me, got to put, uh, got to put, this is a very controversial one, got to put Austin there. I know what people are thinking. They're like, hey, what? You're not going to put, no, it's got to be Austin. So yeah, Eddie, Shelton, and then... Trish, Asuka, and Austin. Those are my five. That's my fave five. 
that'll probably change by like tomorrow or something <laughs> but in this moment those are my five you favorites. know i appreciate you saying you know in this moment these are my five favorites because that's just how i have to do everything because it's like my answer could change depending on whatever type of mood i'm in <laughs> so i appreciate the fact that you were honest and said today it's this but tomorrow it might change so i definitely appreciate that <laughs> I be on some yo let's listen to some scotty to hottie matches one time for the one time <laughs> like i don't know like where i'm gonna be at right okay so you did make mention of it a little bit before um but i wanted to ask you if you would be open to wrestling in any mainstream promotion yeah there are quite a few mainstream promotions that i would be very interested in um Oh, this is a really good person who I forgot to put over. Brandon Espinoza. Um, Brandon Espy. He um, he was one of my um, influences. We talked and worked together a little bit back in the Midwest. He um, did OVW, and I could have on OVW taping if like my blood work cleared like Kentucky was on some BS with me but yeah I could have been on a whole OVW taping this is back when Crimson was down there gee it could have been a whole team it could have been a whole big team it was wild seeing how big people over there were but yeah as far as major promotions would go um, I'm open especially to like AEW WWE, um, I don't co-sign their business practices. I don't agree with a lot of the things they do with their workers. And of course, I hear the money is good, but I've never really been defined by money. So I'm not going to be able to do that one. Uh, New Japan, All Japan, basically any company in Japan, I would be open to any company in... Basically any company that's not WWE or WWE, I would probably be comfortable with. Uh... Yeah, I, it's like a moral thing for me. Um, yeah, TNA has been on the upshot. Um, any Japanese company I would be really cool with. Any British company I would be cool with. Any company in the UK generally I would be pretty cool with. Um, I just kind of have more of a um, affinity towards like the independence of a lot of the other companies. And I do like how AEW and Impact and New Japan... ROH are kind of in this like hodgepodge of like working together but not really I think that's pretty cool. Okay that's so funny that you brought that up because I was just about to ask you how you felt about um, AEW and Impact sort of crossing over as of late I think it's really really cool um, and I honestly like I know from a business perspective that they have to do certain things but I do think that it's very very interesting to have like two major promotions working together in that aspect i feel as though like if the invasion had been done that way that wwe would have made like a billion dollars earlier than they made a billion dollars because gee like just think if we would have had like goldberg taking on like austin we had sting versus taker like we had the hardcore title picture but against ECW like we could have had like so much going on but they chose not to because you know it's Vince's company so I like that um, AEW and TNA are working together in this aspect I think it will leave room for a lot of creativity yeah I think that's the coolest part for me because I believe well I'm really young so I'm, I'm like 27 so I, as far as, huh? I'm, oh, I'm 28. Oh, so I'm sorry. Like <laughs> um, it's just like, I didn't, I didn't know how old you were. I'm sorry. Um, it's just, um, for me, it's like, I have never really seen this much of a crossover, like since I've been a wrestling fan at all. So when they had announced that they were going to do it, I was just like, Oh, <laughs> this is interesting, and it makes you and and it makes you interested in seeing you know what's coming next, and it's sort of opening my mind towards you know other wrestling because I'm a because I am a WWE girl, but it's make but this has sort of opened my mind a little bit more towards other types of other um promotions as well, and that's what I want to do. Like I want to become you know well adjusted and you know 
more well versed in other promotions as well. So this is a good way to sort of start that. So I think it's really cool that that's happening. It's helping me learn and it's making my brain grow and I appreciate it. <laughs> Big brain strategies. Yeah, it makes Love me sound it. like a nerd, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> um, we all yeah. All right. So I want to ask you, what has been your greatest um, accomplishment in wrestling so far? Greatest accomplishment in wrestling so far. That's always really hard for me because I don't really feel like I've accomplished anything. Um, I if you put a gun to my head, I would not be able to tell you. I think I did pretty okay when they gave me, like, the loser weight title. I thought I made some pretty funny jokes with that. Um, um, so, if your fans will know, uh, PWS had this horrible title that they gave me because reasons um, called the loser weight title, where the joke was you get the title by mm-hmm. losing the match. And so, I title and I held it for the longest time anybody has ever held that title. <clears throat> you coronavirus. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. So I held the title for like an inordinate amount of time. Um, and then we, um, we killed the title off by giving it to some YouTuber. But I feel that I did a pretty good job in making people laugh with the title but like I could only do so many jokes with the title especially during like a pandemic there's only so much you could really do with like that though so I think I did okay with that as far as accomplishment goes um I haven't really eaten, like anybody because like when I was back in America I was more of a jobber um and also like I started off green so of course you have to job with Bob when you're green or at least I had to. I don't know. Maybe somebody else would get in the company and they'll just be like winning all of their first year matches. But um, yeah, when I was first coming in, I uh, was jobbing because, you know, that's what you do. Um, then after that, I didn't really do much of anything. Like, this is like no cap. I think I haven't really accomplished anything yet. So my greatest accomplishment is still ahead of me. Okay. And I'm pretty sure whatever it is, it's going to be fantastic. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you oh, so you're much. definitely welcome. So, yeah, I'm putting that out there in the universe. Whatever that great thing is, it's going to hit you and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm just thank you so much. That sounds genuinely nice. You're thank welcome. You so all right, so I want to ask you, um, what exactly inspires you to keep going in this um, career of wrestling? You know, I ask myself that all the time, and it's a few things. It's not entirely altruistic. I think it's definitely more of like an egoistic thing where it's like, I genuinely believe that I could be a, a good entertainer, not just a wrestler, but like actor and Former other, I'm not gonna say which other performance. Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna say which other kinds of performance. But uh, yeah, I think that I have a little bit of talent in a lot of different areas. And so, wrestling is, in one part, like something I love to do, but also like an avenue for me to showcase the things that I can do in other arenas. Um, I'm very good at like improv. I'm very good at stage combat. I'm very good at selling the dramatic seen even if it's more over the top or it's more like reserved or controlled or subtle and so um wrestling gives me an avenue not just to wrestle but also to showcase my other skills things that other people might want to um you know hit me up for you know if they need somebody to do some um uh, you know, voice acting or acting or you know, anything else <laughs> so uh in one part it's because I love wrestling and then the other part is because wrestling also gives me an avenue to showcase all of like my physical skills so much so that like it allowed for me to show what kind of entertainer that I can be not just as somebody who punches people in the face okay 
So basically, what inspires you to keep going is just to know that wrestling gives you the ability to showcase all of your gifts. Yes. yes. I actually like that answer a lot. Um, so I have two more questions for you. And this question is more of a two-part. Um, this question um, is, do you wish to be a great representation of non-binary wrestling talent and how do you think the wrestling business could improve on the amount of opportunities that um, non-binary wrestlers get? So to answer your first question, do I wish to be a great representation of non-binary talent? Um, I feel as though that I am. I feel as though that I don't engage in anything that I would consider problematic as far as attitudes towards non-binary characters. Um, as far as my character's portrayal of being like non-binary, I feel as though that I'm pretty good at selling, hey, I'm a non-binary character, not, I'm a character, rather, I'm a character who is non-binary, not a non-binary character. I don't do any of the, um, I guess you would say, hackneyed things of like, um, I guess you would say like poor drag or like poor cross-dressing where I'm like making a joke out of gender bending or anything of that nature because like I feel as though that would be one like very offensive and two I think it would be very um, lazy on my part because it's just, like it's easy to get people to react to you when you're a uh, quote-unquote male body in a dress but like if I come out in a dress and I look better than everybody else in the ring which I mean a, bit, a girl might just do that just to flex on somebody. Mm-hmm. But if there's effort put into it, I don't feel as though that it would be like derogatory in any kind of way. But as far as like mainstream wrestling goes, like AEW hasn't really had a chance to cross that bridge. But we've seen how WWE deals with like anybody who's on like the LGBTQ spectrum, um, which is to say that um, uh, it's not good. Like, Darren Young probably was the best representation for like gay wrestlers and his whole shtick was just you know he was a hard working guy and then he came out as gay and then it was like oh he's a hard working gay guy and it was like cool and then he got the tag team titles and then like disappeared um and that's like the best thing you could see from them that it was a neutral because like from WWE, from what I've seen of their, like, portrayals of being, like, not strictly, like, super heterosexual uh, and male, because uh, uh, WWE and their um, relationships with women is, um, I mean, it's gotten better, but uh, it used to be pretty uh, sus. As far as major companies getting better, I feel as though, like, you have to be one cognizant of what you're trying to do and too aware of like the effects that it could possibly have sunny kiss is a really really good example um aew has done a wonderful job with sunny kiss because like sunny kiss is as flamboyant as he wants to be he does all of the things that he wants to do um and at no point are you ever like at no point is the focus of the match oh man Look how gay Sunny Kiss is. Isn't he just so gay? Oh my God. Look how, like, there's never been a point in, like, AEW from what I've seen where the emphasis was on that he was homosexual in any kind of context. He's just flamboyant and they move on and it's wonderful. Um, the fact that he is, um, is of course inherent to the character, but it's not something that is necessarily, um, it's inherent to the character, but it's not necessarily a focal point. It's not enough. It's, it's not something that they feel the need to overemphasize. And I feel as though that might be something that people might want to look into if portraying like non-binary characters, trans characters. Nyla Rose is another good example. They don't ever bring up her transness, I believe. Like she's just a woman wrestler. And that's really, really good because like as much heat as people try to put on them, for having a trans woman wrestler she's been getting better she gets heat like nobody um especially because um AEW do a lot better with their women's division but at the same time 
Um, I do feel as though they do a really, really good job in like navigating those areas, like allowing for people to exist in spaces without necessarily making their existence the only thing that they're there for. And so that would be a really good point thing for any kind of representation to allow for the characters to be characters, not to have a characteristic be the character. Okay. I appreciate and I love that answer. And I just wanted to ask you that because I just felt like um, that was just an important that was just an important thing to mention and to just talk about during our time together. So I'm glad that you um, expounded upon that the way that you did. So I have one last question. Um, What does the future hold for Duncan Solaire? Fingers crossed. I'm going to be getting a tag team gimmick going. Uh, We're going to probably get them straps. Um, (laughs) Get the straps. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's a triple entendre. That's oof, that's a triple entendre. No, that might even be quadruple entendre. Oh my! Anyway, um, we hopefully me and Un, uh, do some more tag team wrestling, and that'll be the focus for a little while. I'm gonna be working on like my promos. I'm gonna be working on like stagecraft as well as um, like. I'm going to be doing a lot more um, YouTubing as well as this pandemic doesn't seem to want to like die off at all. Um, I'm going to be doing more like political things because um, I'm a very political person and I feel as though that in the situation that the world is in, I feel I could use my voice to sort of highlight some issues that are affecting not just myself but other people who are like me whether that is black whether that is queer um whether that is um people who are on the lower socioeconomic standing than what we would consider uh to be average um yeah no i believe that we have limited time on this planet and so like i want to use the time that I have to do as much good as I can. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm planning on doing for the next year. Wrestling more, hopefully, fingers crossed, being able to wrestle in another country. But if not, then working to be the best wrestler in Korea and have the best tag team in Korea and win all of the titles in Korea. <laughs> well, all right, then. Duncan, thank you so much for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. I appreciate your time and your presence on my show. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It was a pleasure. All right. So um, if you don't mind putting yourself over and telling everybody where they can follow you on social media and anything else you have going on. Not a problem. Hey, hello, everybody. It's D-U-N-C again. Duncan Sold Air. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Now, if you want to follow me, you want to get some treats for your eyes and for your ears, you can follow me on Instagram at the Duncan Solaire. You can also subscribe to me on YouTube at Duncan Solaire. And uh, that's about it. But if you want more of the Duncan, you can always, you know, just, just ask. You know, I'll, I'll open up some other stuff if you need me to do it. But yeah, Instagram at the Duncan Solaire and YouTube Duncan Solaire. If ever you need some more Duncan Solaire for you, it's for you, baby. It's not for me. It's for you. I do it for you. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for having me. And I hope you have a wonderful day. You too. Okay, so I want to send a special thank you to Duncan Solaire for um, appearing on my show. They were an absolute delight to have, and I really appreciated their conversation. So now what I'm going to do is, um, this is normally where I do my weekly recap segment, but here I actually want to do TLC predictions because that's actually taking place on tomorrow on the WWE Network. That's a pay-per-view that's involving tables, ladders, and chairs. So it's going to be pretty extreme. Some of the matches do have stipulations with tables, ladders, and chairs. Some of them don't, but it's still going to be a good pay-per-view either way. So I'm going to start, of course, with my girls. 
So the women's tag team championships are going to be on the line uh, with Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler as the champions facing Asuka and an opponent and a, not an opponent, a partner of her choosing since Lana got injured in her fight with Nia Jax. Um, so this past Monday. So there's a lot of speculation as to who Asuka could choose. There's Nikki Cross, who we really haven't seen on television in such a long time, and I would be really happy to see her. Then there's also Charlotte Flair, um, who could make a return. And then there's also Naomi, who could make a return. Um, and then there's also the possibility of either Dana Brooke or um, Mandy Rose, who actually just made her return this past Monday and started beating Nia Jax with a kendo stick and also Shayna Baszler with a kendo stick. Because they were a part of the reason why she possibly got injured, even though she fell or whatever. But basically, they're part of the reason why she got injured and now she's back and she came out with a vengeance and started attacking them. So it would kind of make sense mostly if it was just man if it was Mandy Rose. But I would just be, you know, really happy with more of a surprise return if it was Naomi or Charlotte Flair. I'm not sure how long Naomi's supposed to be on break, but the um but the fandom is really missing her on social media. Also the fandom is missing Charlotte Flair. So there's no telling who Oscar could choose and considering I'm not sure if it would be Charlotte Flair, considering um, Charlotte is one of Oscar's greatest, you know, opponents and enemies. So I'm not sure if she would actually choose her. There was a point where even on um, Twitter, Oscar was, you know, playing with the idea of possibly choosing Kyrie Sane, who does still work for WWE in Japan. So I don't know. We'll see. But I really, really hope that whoever Oscar chooses, you know, she'll actually wind up winning. Um, because honestly. Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, you know, they are good women's tag team champions, but they're not, they're just not as, they're not pushed as much as they could be in terms of their strengths. It's like, they're made to do all this goofy bullying stuff. Now, mind you, the bullying stuff is all, is pretty cerebral in terms of how they're treating Lana um, emotionally and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's a little bit sad, you know, because it's like they're not playing to their strengths a whole lot. You have Nia Jax, the powerhouse, you know, who can't be ran over. And then you have Shayna Baszler, who's just an absolute technical machine. And they're just not playing into those strengths, you know, as much as I would prefer. Um, so therefore, I really predict that this might be their last go round with those titles and they might and they might just as well lose them um on Sunday to Asuka and whoever she chooses to be her partner so yeah there's that also with the women you have Sasha Banks the Smackdown Women's Champion going up against Carmella and I know without a shadow of a doubt Sasha Banks is gonna win (laughs) <laughs> because not because I constantly talk about her as the goat and I constantly talk about how amazing she is as a you know outside crossover star in terms of how she's been acting on the Mandalorian especially this past Friday where she did a um a DDT a tornado DDT on Boba Fett and that was awesome to all of those Star Wars fans but it just seems like now WWE is putting their gas behind her and actually giving her a substantial title reign. So it wouldn't make sense for her to lose it to a to a returning Carmella who's come back with a new attitude like Patti LaBelle and thinks she's an absolute snob with the sommelier and all that other stuff. So I predict that Sasha Banks is going to win and basically make short, not short work of Carmella, but short work of Carmella, because as good as Carmella is with what she can do, you just can't beat Sasha Banks' IQ in that ring. Her ring psychology, like her arsenal is just too, it's just too much. Like it's just way too much for, for all of Carmella's, you know, um, for all of the car for all of Carmela's moves and all of her underhandedness that she's gonna have with her Somalia probably out there. But Sasha Banks has shown that she is not, you know, above kicking that Somalia's butt because she slapped him yesterday. And <laughs> and not only did she slap him yesterday, like last week she put him in the bank statement. So I mean she's not above beating up the Somalia either. So I feel like that's the X factor, but ultimately I feel like Sasha Banks is gonna win because girl Carmella just she 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 just doesn't she just doesn't have it and I am enjoying Carmella's um character work because it is a lot different than her whole fabulous persona that she did have which I also enjoyed I actually love you know Carmella as a wrestler and I also and I 
absolutely love her as a person but at the same time her character you know is made to sort of get on your nerves a bit because she thinks she's better and all this other stuff and even on talking smack when she was talking to kayla um paul Heyman and booker t she was talking about how she made as much history as sasha banks has and yeah girl you were you know mrs money in the bank twice and you did become this um the second winner of the wrestlemania battle royal and stuff like that and yeah you may have done cool stuff on the mismatch challenge and you may have been a 24 7 champion but and you and you may have won the smackdown women's title you know one time and you're great but girl you're just not sasha banks <laughs> you're just not sasha banks and once you stack up everything that Sasha Banks has done over the last five years for someone who's just 28 years old, you just can't compare. So from a character standpoint, Carmela, you just don't stand a chance against Sasha Banks. But I love you, girl, in real life. Um, <laughs> so that's pretty much it for the women. So for the men, we have the WWE Championship match between um, Drew McIntyre and AJ Styles in a TLC match. Now, AJ Styles does have the X factor here because he has his bodyguard almost out there, you know, as an insurance policy. So it's not I'm pretty sure he's not above, you know, using dirty tactics to try to cheat. But seeing as this is a TLC match, you know, it's almost like he has all of the advantages of the weapons and almost. So we'll see how that plays out. But I feel like this match is going to be good because when it when you have Drew McIntyre, who's a big powerhouse himself and just a heavyweight beefcake, you know, they're just going to put their all on the line in this match. And I feel like it's going to be entertaining regardless. Um, so I predict that AJ Styles is going to put up a really good fight with all of his X factorness with Omos and the tables, ladders and chairs stipulation, but Drew McIntyre is ultimately going to win because I believe that somehow or another, he's going to have to face his best friend at some point. They're beefing that somehow. So Drew is going to retain. And I just feel like that's what's going to happen. But AJ Styles is going to put up a good fight because he's one of the goats. So it's going to be a good show. We also have the Universal Championship match between Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens. And baby, the way that they've been beefing them up to fight over the past couple of weeks, I'm really excited for it. And especially last night on Talking Smack, where Paul Heyman seemed really worried for Kevin Owens because he feels like Kevin Owens is tapping into a part of Roman Reigns that we have yet to see. And he seemed like really terrified about it. So, um... But Kevin Owens wasn't quitting at all. Like for everything with Jay Uso and with Roman Reigns attacking him, you know, multiple times throughout the night and then burying him between a sea, burying him with a sea of chairs and tables and ladders and stuff and him still getting up from it. Like this is going to be this is going to be a totally different and more intense Kevin Owens than we've seen. And he's a face. So, you know, that's going to be good. Um, <laughs> um, so it's just kind of like. I don't like I feel like Roman Reigns will ultimately retain the title through some type of underhanded tactic but at the same time Kevin Owens is isn't gonna back down from him either like you have these two bulls going up each other and they're bumping heads like it's gonna be really good and it's gonna be really intense and I just feel like anything Roman Reigns does from a character perspective is just gonna kick butt regardless so it's gonna be really good and I'm excited for it we also have the match between The Fiend, Bray Wyatt versus Randy Orton in a Firefly Inferno match, I believe is what it's called. Um, because this past Monday, I believe Randy Orton tried to set Bray Wyatt on fire and then The Fiend came out of the firebox <laughs> and it was a whole lot. So I'm just sort of sitting here like, you know what? This is going to be really good because I feel like this year, if WWE has shown us anything, is the fact that they know how to put on cinematic matches. And I feel like this is going to be really good in the sense that you have um, the fiend Bray Wyatt who thrives in these type of environments where, you know, he sort of has more control because it's his arena. He, it's the whole Firefly Funhouse thing. So it's, if it's his arena, then he's going to take full advantage of the mind games and all the stuff. But then you have Randy Orton, who's, you know, evil. He's evil, but I feel like he's not fiendish evil. So 
I feel like Bray Wyatt is going to come out the winner. Like, The Fiend is definitely going to come out the winner here because he's more of the supernatural figure that we have now that's going to take advantage of Randy Orton and his, you know, sort of common world evil type of thing he has going on. So I feel like The Fiend is definitely going to win, but it's going to be cool, though. So hey whatever also i've been missing alexa bliss with the fiend too like you can never go wrong with those two together and i've been missing her but it's rumored that she's you know filming for a punky brewster um show so yeah i miss her we also have um the raw tag team championship match between the new day and the hurt business now i This is going to be really hard for me to sort of choose a winner for because here lately, the Hurt Business, especially through the for in the form of Cedric Alexander, has been taking advantage of the New Day and basically playing on their weaknesses and sort of beating them up and getting more vicious on them. And I feel I feel like maybe just maybe the Hurt Business might have the New Day's number. Um, And yeah, you could say the New Day has more of the advantage because they're more of the veterans. Um, Well, no, because really you have three veterans in this. You have Shelton Benjamin and you have Kofi. And at this point you have Xavier. Um, They've all been there, you know, a lot longer than Cedric Alexander has. But what's so funny is what Cedric lacks in experience, he makes up for in his veracity. So it's just like... He's ready to prove himself, to really prove himself. And if he has to beat up these, beat up these, you know, smiley face, you know, nobodies like the New Day, then he'll definitely do that. Um, But I really want to believe the New Day can pull it off. But if they do pull it off, it's going to take a whole lot of more intensity on their part. Um, But somehow or another, I feel that the Hurt Business will definitely come out with the win because they have more to prove and the new day at this point have won the tag team title so many times they really don't have that much to prove they have enough to prove but not so much so as the hurt business does and i wouldn't necessarily be mad if the hurt business won either because they've been on a tear and they've been on a winning streak and then again you can't really go wrong with two amazing black tag teams so black excellence all around the hurt business wins i won't be mad and if the new day wins i won't be mad either so that's really all that we have with tlc and all of those predictions and now we're gonna go to the conclusion right so thank you so much for listening to this new episode of the hardy wrestling podcast i want to send a special thank you shout out to duncan solaire for making an appearance on my show it's a funny story we took a whole long time to get together but once we did we did and i'm so happy to have talked to them um please support them in everything that they're doing on social media and also on youtube to watch their matches please you know see what they've got going on Also, I would like to thank all of my listeners, you know, for supporting me. I'm so happy um, to announce that last week I've reached 1000 plays for my podcast. um, And I'm really grateful and humbled by that because I try and work really hard on this show. And I'm just really happy that it's resonated with as many people as it's resonated with. And I'm glad it's opened as many opportunities as it has. And I'm just really grateful to my higher power for that. And I'm just really happy to have a platform to discuss this thing that I really love, which is professional wrestling. And, you know, it's only going to go up from here. Now, next week, you know, a lot of people are doing year in review stuff. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do, considering it's next Saturday is like the day after Christmas. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but something is going to happen and I'm pretty sure it's going to be great. (laughs) Um, So I'm just going to take some time to have some fun this week, you know, and just, you know, think about what's going to come next. And honestly, what's going to, you know, pop off within the next year because a new year is coming and there's just so much that could very well happen. There's so many possibilities. So with that in mind, just thank you so much for supporting my show. Um, I'm also 
still selling my chill positive and passionate um black and white t-shirts for twenty dollars um if you want one please message me they come in the sizes of small um through extra large and if you need a bigger size you can just let me know and um yeah just continue to support the show and listen to it on all platforms iHeartRadio, spotify the anchor app if you have it apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, you know just and my youtube um channel and also follow me on instagram at hardy wrestling podcast and you can um follow me on twitter at hardy wrestle pod um i'm gonna i'm doing some construction on my twitter page right now so you know if you want to follow me please go ahead and do that um, I may create a whole new Twitter page because of what's going on, but I can't really, I don't want to get into that right now, but just know I'm constructing a new Twitter page possibly. So, you know, just continue to support the show and continue to tell your friends about it and listen to it, whether you're a wrestling fan or not. So just continue to support this girl. Um, <laughs> so until next time, this is the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl, Stephanie Hardy. Bye y'all.